our keynote speaker of the 2022 JGI user meeting, which is Dr. Jennifer Doudna. Jennifer holds many titles and affiliations. She's the Key Lashings Chancellor Chair and Professor at the University of California in Berkeley. Jennifer also is also president and chair of the board of the Innovative Genomics Institute and a faculty scientist here at our Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. She's a member of a very long list of prestigious academies and sciences, including the National Academy of Sciences, and has received numerous honors and prizes. Most importantly, she received together with collaborator Emmanuel Carpentier the 2022 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for their truly groundbreaking work on CRISPR-Cas9 as a genome engineering technology, which led to the CRISPR re revolution. And I think I don't have to tell all of you that this had major implications in the fields of biology and medicine. So without further ado, let's hear from Jennifer about her work on CRISPRology, the science and applications of genome editing. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here, there virtually, and to have an opportunity to speak with all of you about the science we're doing and how it integrates with some of the wonderful work going on at the JGI. I'm going to uh, share here and hopefully this goes smoothly. Right. So I'm excited to talk about work that we've been doing in the lab and at the Innovative Genomics Institute to advance what I call CRISPRology, understanding the science of genome editing and also importantly, how it can be applied. And today I'm actually going to focus primarily on work that is going on at the IGI to advance the use of CRISPR in microbes. I think it's highly relevant to the work that we just heard about and that we'll hear about in, in uh, further talks at, at this meeting. So um, certainly welcome feedback and uh, either today or, or in the future about how we might be able to partner with people that are uh, working within the JGI. So um, just quickly wanted to, to put this up to show uh, various affiliations, and I should have LBNL on here as well, of course, as I've very proudly uh, been a longtime uh, faculty affiliate of the lab, which has been wonderful for us. And I'm also involved with a number of companies that are shown up here. It's been an honor to be uh, primarily working at the University of California as a public institution where we really highlight the role of science in society and, and advancing the, you know, ultimately the good of humanity. And that's really something that we take to heart at the IGI. So I wanted to start by just diving into, you know, just tell you uh, what I'm going to tell you, which is I'm, I want to talk a little bit about the backstory to genome editing. And as some of you might know, it's actually now been 10 years since Emmanuel Charpentier and I published our work in 2012 showing that CRISPR-Cas9 works as an RNA-guided DNA cleaver that can be harnessed as a genome editing tool. And so I'm gonna, I'll just tell you a little bit about that original work. And then I want to mainly focus on what is going on right now at the Institute to um, you know, use CRISPR to do what I call unlocking the, the biology of microbiomes. And, um, and so just by way of introduction, I want to, to show a video that maybe some of you have seen, but I think it highlights what the really goes to the heart of why CRISPR is a powerful genome editing technology. And it's really because it's RNA program. So this is showing a protein called Cas9 with its RNA guide, searching a genome, identifying a 20 base pair matching sequence where one strand matches the guide RNA sequence in the RNA. And the protein unwinds the DNA, forms an RNA-DNA hybrid, and then allows the protein to generate a double-stranded DNA break. And it's that chemistry, that fundamental reaction, that then triggers DNA repair in eukaryotic cells, such as the example shown here, where uh, a small change is introduced into the genome in the process of repair. Or, and of course, this can be harnessed it to use uh, the same technology for inserting segments of DNA into genomes, and also can, of course, be used in microbes, as we'll discuss today. And so it's, uh, it's just proven to be a platform that is widely adaptable to essentially any aspect of biology where 
genome manipulation can be beneficial either for fundamental research or for applications. And this all came from studies that were done originally by bioinformaticians and microbiologists who were studying how bacteria use an RNA-guided system known as CRISPR to defend themselves against foreign genetic material. And this is a cartoon that shows here on the left the way the pathway works in which cells, these are microbes that have a CRISPR system, have the ability to acquire short segments of foreign DNA into the CRISPR locus in the genome, a very distinctive locus. Jill Banfield's lab was one of the first to identify it through the signature uh, sequences of repetitive elements that are shown here in these green diamonds that flanked unique spacer sequences marked by the square S. And these spacers turned out in many cases to map to sequences found in bacteriophage. And that was really the first important clue that this system might in fact be some kind of adaptive immune system in microbes. And various labs went on to show that these sequences are transcribed into RNA molecules uh, shown here that include the sequence in red that in this that marks the the um, a sequence that was acquired originally from an invading bacteriophage. And importantly, that sequence in the form of the RNA forms the guide that can identify matching sequences for cleavage and ultimately destruction in microbes. And so when we got involved in this work really because of Jill Banfield's um, uh, early identification of CRISPR sequences. And we had, I, I have to really acknowledge the lab for this, we had uh, very early uh, funding from LBNL to work on some experiments to start dissecting the biochemistry of this system. This is really back before anybody really knew what these systems were actually doing. And, um, and that was incredibly enabling that, that work, that, uh, that money funded Blake Wiedenheft, who was the first member of my lab to begin working on these systems biochemically and doing some structural biology. And ultimately that led a few years later to our work with collaborator Emmanuel Charpentier showing that in fact, these RNA uh, molecules that are used in these CRISPR associated or Cas proteins like Cas9 are engineerable. They can actually be, um, they can be designed in the lab. They can be um, programmed with sequences that uh, we'd like to, to identify for DNA cutting. Triggers the CRISPR associated protein to make a precise cut in a genome at a position where an editing reaction is desirable. And that's really the, the fundamental um, you know, path that the technology took from original curiosity-driven research to um, recognizing that the, this system could be harnessed as a powerful technology. And I just really wanna share one experiment with you um, that, that I think just, you know, especially for, for students in the audience just shows the value of you know, just asking sometimes very simple questions that can actually be quite enlightening if you have a good answer to it. And so this is a cartoon that shows work that uh, represents research that we were doing originally with the Charpentier lab. And it was two scientists, Martin Yinek in my group and Chris Chylinski in Emmanuel's lab who were working on this project. And they did the biochemical experiments showing that CRISPR-Cas9, this uh, CRISPR-associated protein, uses an RNA guide. And in fact, in nature, it's a dual RNA, as shown here, two transcripts that come together to form an interaction with the protein that provides both the, the structural support to the protein and the guide sequence here, in this case shown in green, that targets Cas9 to a particular DNA sequence, and, and then how that leads to DNA melting and, and, and double strand break formation. And so when we did this original biochemical work, Martin Yinek in the lab was, um, you know, was curious about whether this system could actually be deployed like a, almost like a restriction enzyme. Could you truly program Cas9 with 
a desired uh, sequence here in the RNA and trigger targeted double-stranded DNA cleavage. And so he did an experiment to test this. And so the, in the first instance, we asked, you know, could we actually simplify the RNA to form a single guide format? In other words, uh, an RNA that would be a single transcript that would include both, both the guide sequence shown here in blue and the portion of the RNA that was important we suspected for assembly with the Cas9 protein, which in this cartoon is shown in red. And so Martin made a series of different types of you know, fusion uh, transcripts. One example is shown here. And then he did a very simple, but in the end, a uh, very important experiment to test whether this type of RNA could in fact guide Cas9 to specific DNA sequences for cleavage. And I'll just show the result here. And uh, by the way, this actually ended up in a in a supplement, <laughs> supplemental figure in the paper we published. So most people, maybe if they haven't looked at the supplement, haven't seen this, but it's still in some ways my favorite experiment in, in that whole uh, study because it really shows the power of the technology. And so what you're seeing here is um, a cartoon of a plasmid that was used in the experiment. And the idea was to design a series of different guide RNAs that are labeled uh, GFP one through five here, that as you can see, would recognize sequences on either strand of the DNA in a portion of the plasmid DNA. And then some distance away was a restriction site for, uh, for an enzyme cell one that we could use to do a double digest. And so the experiment, and this is, you know, for those of you that have had, you know, uh, freshman uh, molecular or sophomore year molecular biology lab, you've probably done an experiment like this, or most people probably did this in high school nowadays. Um, but basically you do a double digest and you ask whether the fragment of DNA released corresponds to the size that you would predict based on the position of the guide RNA location in this case. And you might imagine the excitement that we had when we saw this result initially, where we saw these little fragments of DNA being released in these double digests here being analyzed on an agarose gel system in which each of the pieces of DNA released in the reaction corresponded to the size expected based on where this guide RNA would be directing Cas9 to cut. So that was really uh, for us the moment when we realized we had a very powerful tool an RNA guided cleaver that could be controlled for introducing DNA manipulations. And of course, 10 years later, this you, you many of you know that this fundamental platform of RNA guided proteins is being utilized for lots of different applications that include not only gene disruption or replacement, but also controlling transcription in cells for, or for, for molecular diagnostics and also for uh, cell based imaging. And so it and it's really all comes back to that fundamental RNA guided chemistry. And so quickly, I want to just uh, describe a couple of, of um, experiments or experimental you know, systems that we've been using in the lab to go after these two questions. First of all, to understand fundamentally how CRISPR genome editing works. And secondly, to ask whether we whether and how we can use CRISPR to start to unlock the fundamental biology of microbiomes. And so just to address the first question, um, I just want to say a few, a few words about the way that this type of protein like Cas9 functions, because I think it's, I think it's actually fascinating. Uh, there's still, believe it or not, after 10 years, still a number of open questions that we don't fully understand about how it works. But, um, but we know that, that Cas9 is an enzyme that recognizes a sequence in double-stranded DNA and there's a few things that are particular about that recognition. First of all, it requires that the guide RNA be complementary to a strand of DNA, that, such as this sequence that's highlighted in red here. And importantly, that sequence must, and, and really must, be located next to a small motif that uh, for sort of historical reasons is called the protospacer adjacent motif, much easier to remember it as the PAM. And that sequence, which for Cas9 is a, a, a pair of GC base pairs, as shown here, is one of the reasons that this protein is able to unwind double-stranded DNAs through an interaction between the protein and this motif 
that melts open the DNA adjacent to it and allows interrogation by the guide RNA. And so we've been, you know, working on understanding how that works for some time. And this is just a, a summary of some experiments that were done by Sam Sternberg, a former graduate student, and Cy Redding, who was a, a graduate student at Columbia in the lab of Eric Green, our collaborator on this particular aspect of the work in which we were using Eric Green's lovely single molecule system called DNA curtains to identify the way that Cas9 and its RNA guide interact with molecules of DNA, even phage-sized uh, molecules of DNA. And what we found was that Cas9 protein alone has very low binding affinity for DNA. When it acquires its RNA guide, it has a longer lifetime on DNA. And, uh, and then it, what, what uh, happens next is that somehow this RNA guided protein is able to surveil the genome to identify these PAM motifs, which of course would occur quite frequently in a, in a typical genome. And that somehow leads to local DNA melting to enable interrogation of the adjacent sequence, shown here by just a few base pairing interactions forming between the RNA guide and the DNA. And if that's all there is, then this is a very transient interaction and Cas9 falls off and moves on to the next site. But if there is extensive complementarity, then this type of interaction called an R loop forms, and that is what enables DNA cleavage. And, um, and so more recently, Josh Kofsky, who graduated very recently from the laboratory, was a biophysics graduate student who was working on understanding this in more molecular detail in collaboration with the lab of John Curian. And I'm just going to show one highlight of his work. So we used electron, um, we used uh, electron microscopy in this case to determine structures of Cas9 in a state where it was associated with DNA. Um, but, but in the examples that shown here, this uh, red sequence did not actually have complementarity to the RNA guide. And the idea here was just to try to capture a very transient interaction between the protein with its RNA guide and this PAM motif in yellow that would be adjacent to a, a putative binding site for Cas9. And so how do we, how do we capture something that didn't really have a long lifetime because it doesn't have the ability to form an RNA DNA hybrid. And the way that Josh did this was to create a chemical crosslink. And I won't go into the details of how he did that. It's in a recent publication and on BioRecord, but um, but I'll just show you the result of this analysis. And that is that we realized that Cas9 undergoes a large rearrangement. Um, and it's probably a quite a, a rapid um, um, uh, back and forth between a closed and open form of the protein that when closed, as shown here, triggers DNA bending and local unwinding of the DNA adjacent to this PAM sequence in yellow. And that's really what we think enables initial interrogation with the RNA guide. If there's initial complementarity there, then that interaction has a bit of a longer lifetime and the interrogation can continue. If there's no complementarity, then this is quite transient and the, the protein complex moves on. And so fundamentally, we think that this uh, type of interaction, which is now being explored further using um, other single molecule experiments in the lab of Zeb Bryant down at Stanford, is explaining how Cas9 can bend and twist DNA to effectively read the sequence next to PAMS, even though that sequence would normally be um, you know, inaccessible in its single-stranded form. And we think also that the search speed, how fast a protein like Cas9 is able to search the genome is a function of this intrinsic protein dynamics, an idea that, again, we're testing using this single molecule approach. And then thirdly, that search speed is different. It's distinct from the DNA binding or cutting speed. And so in principle, one could imagine altering the search speed, for example, speeding it up to create um, perhaps genome editing tools that would be even better or faster than those that exist currently. So those are some of the ideas that have come out of this more you know, fundamental biophysical and structural analysis of how proteins like Cas9 operate. Um, and these are, again, some of the open questions. We'd like to understand uh, whether search speed is in fact limiting, what the natural diversity of target search speeds might be, and whether we can access faster 
uh, searchers, perhaps through protein engineering. Um, and so, you know, as the field of, of genome editing has moved forward, of course, there's lots of, of different applications uh, ranging from basic, you know, very fundamental research to uh, uses in medicine and in agriculture. And, and today, I wanted to, in particular, highlight what I think is is one of the exciting new directions that's really kind of not reflected on a slide like this, which is going back to the roots of where CRISPR came from and using it in those organisms that actually encode CRISPR systems, namely in microbes. And so we've wanted to ask whether CRISPR technology can in fact effectively unlock microbiome biology. Can we start to use genome editing tools to investigate the biology of microbes, not in isolation or cultured in a laboratory, but in their native settings. And that's, of course, a long-term long goal and truly enabled through our, our longstanding uh, work with Jill Banfield's lab and, and with um, various people up at the lab. And so um, at, the, at the Innovative Genomics Institute, and here I just want to briefly mention our institute because um, we're, we're an organization that we started in 2015 as a partnership between UC Berkeley and UCSF. We've now included the Gladstone Institutes in that partnership, and uh, we work under the auspices of the university. But because we're a, we're a you know, somewhat um, independent organization, not uh, not not truly independent, but you know where we have some autonomy in the way that we do set up our our operations, we are able to experiment. I would say with different ways of doing science, and so one of the one of the things that I'm excited about right now is that we've been able to build a team of young investigators that have formed a group they call Biome Forge, which is really uh, about uncovering new biology using microbial community editing. And, and so the idea here for the science is to ultimately have a set of genome editing tools that are optimized for microbes, not for uh, eukaryotic cells, but actually for my, working in microbes that would have minimal phylogenetic limits. In other words, they would work in lots of different kinds of, of organisms and classes of organisms that uh, we would have an initial focus on both soil and gut microbiomes and that we could do fundamental biology with these types of tools, including things like determining symbiotic relationships between different microbial species and between microbes and their hosts. And there's you know, some very interesting, compelling evidence uh, coming out of metagenomic sequencing that, um, that there are these symbiotic relationships. It's just that we haven't really had tools that have enabled investigation of the genetics of, of those relationships. And that's what we hope this type of technology could do. And so who's in BioForge? Well, it's a wonderful group, uh, three investigators that are shown here, Ben Rubin, Brady Kress, and Spencer Diamond. So all three of them have been hired as project scientists at the University of California. They're working within the Institute and they have uh, funding to work as uh, both independent investigators and in a highly collaborative, cooperative fashion. And so they have different types of expertise. And as I'll, I'll show you in, in, the, in the forthcoming slides, they've worked together to pioneer applications of microbiome editing and uh, develop a, a you know, continually advancing the tool set for doing this, as well as the kind of bioinformatic capabilities that will enable future investigations. And so it's been amazing to see these three scientists working together and now establishing their own laboratories at the IGI to do this work. And so I don't have to really, uh, this is probably preaching to the choir here, but you all know, I think that um, individual microbes function within microbial communities within microbiomes. And, um, and they, we know now that they have, these microbiomes have important roles in human health. I'm showing an example here for the human gut, but there's increasing evidence that microbiomes also affect uh, neurological function, probably other aspects of, of human biology and animal uh, biology that have yet to be uncovered. And uh, they're also important in very practical aspects of agriculture, such as livestock emissions. And we know that these gut communities in ruminants affect the, um, the um, production of methane, for example. Furthermore, we know that microbiome manipulation is hard. 
And so there, although there are mitigations that are that are proposed and being tested, for example, to control ruminant gut microbiomes and the production of methane through feedstock uh, adjustment, it's not a trivial uh, matter to grow and harvest seaweed, for example, to supplement these animal diets and to produce it, transport it, and, um, and disseminate it in ways that will truly have global impact in terms of carbon emissions. And so we feel strongly that there is a need for the ability to perhaps fundamentally manipulate this microbiome directly. If you have the technology to do that, it could truly be impactful. Um, and similarly, manipulating the, the human microbiome is difficult. Um, antibiotics have been um, introduced over the years, but in recent times, uh, not so much. And so we're all, I think, familiar with the fact that um, antibiotic resistance is a major issue, and we do need to have new ways to manipulate the microbes that affect us uh, both in health and disease. And, um, and also that uh, when you have an antibiotic, it typically is, um, is uh, either not very selective, or if it's selective, it may alter the microbiome composition in ways that are um, have you know side effects that are undesirable. And so there's a need for various kinds of antibiotic alternatives. So Van Rubin, who came to our lab a few years back as a, a postdoctoral scientist, set out to ask whether we could actually develop ways to use CRISPR in these natural uh, microbial communities. And as I'll discuss today, we're primarily this Initial work has been primarily conducted in synthetic communities for maybe obvious reasons, but ultimately it would be uh, exciting and desirable to be able to use them in natural communities. And we do have some data pointing to the efficacy there that I'll, I'll talk about at the end of the uh, presentation. And so the idea was sort of twofold. The, uh, the strategy here was to initially ask how many of these different kinds of microbes in a complex community are capable of taking up foreign DNA? Of course, if you want to do genomic manipulation, that's fundamental that we have to be able to get new DNA into these cells. And so the first question that Ben Rubin asked was whether we could just uh, develop a, a strategy to figure out who takes up DNA and with what efficiencies and, and what um, methods are of DNA delivery and how those affect uh, the efficiency of genome modification. And then secondly, um, collaborating with another uh, former now postdoctoral scholar in my lab, Brady Kress, using a targeted CRISPR editing strategy to manipulate the, the genomes of just you know, very specific organisms in a complex community and doing all of this in, in collaboration with Spencer Diamond, um, who was providing a lot of the, the bioinformatic and metagenomics uh, support for this work. And so um, Van Rubin ended up developing a strategy called environmental transformation sequencing or ETSeq, in which he used non-targeted transposons that could go into different types of cells and make genomic modifications that could be mapped using sequencing. And, um, and so that would give you a measure of insertion efficiency. And then of course we had to divide that by the abundances of these different organisms within this microbial community context to get uh, a measure of sort of absolute insertion efficiency. And so by doing this, and really um, I'm summarizing here a lot of effort to make this uh, uh, pipeline a, a pretty efficient process, it was possible to do quantitative measurement of genetic accessibility. And not surprisingly, we found that you know, some microbes are much more amenable to taking up foreign DNA than, than others are. And, um, and furthermore, that these uh, that DNA uptake is quite dependent on the way that that DNA is delivered. And I'll just show you an example of this. And so this was uh, one of the experiments that uh, Ben Rubin and his collaborators did to test the um, DNA uptake by members of a synthetic microbial community, a nine member uh, synthetic community. And the approach was to conduct this ETSeq strategy using different methods of delivery that range from natural transformation to conjugation and electroporation. 
And, um, and interestingly, when we looked at the actual data, which are an example is shown here in this um, image on the bottom, this plot, what we found was that uh, we could plot insertion efficiency on the y-axis as a function of the organism and its abundance in this nine-member community on the x-axis. Not surprisingly, the more abundant the organism, the easier it was to detect insertion efficiencies, of course. But I think strikingly what we found was that different organisms had different preferences for the way the DNA was actually delivered to them. And so, um, again, not perhaps not surprising, but important information to have if one wants to be able to manipulate particular organisms within a complex community. One of the things that Ben and his co collaborators are now working on is ways to extend the sensitivity of a method like this so that we can reach deeper down into a community like this where you have organisms that are quite in abundant where nonetheless you might like to be able to manipulate them genetically and in a specific fashion, but in the context of their, um, their microbial neighbors. And so in, a, in the end, we found that this approach can reproducibly measure the genetic accessibility of particularly of abundant uh, community members, and that we can use this type of strategy to figure out um, you know, how to optimize the DNA delivery, as well as lots of other aspects of the way the genome manipulation is being conducted. And then um, using taking that as our kind of our, our baseline, uh, this, the, the, the second piece of this pipeline was to actually use a targeted CRISPR-Cas editing system to introduce genes into these microbes. And, um, we benefited here from the fact that uh, about two or maybe three years ago now, I guess it was three years ago now, um, two different labs published targeted CRISPR-Cas editing systems in which CRISPR arrays, these sequence arrays in microbes, are naturally incorporated into transposon or transposase containing operons. And what these two different groups showed is that uh, these represent targeted CRISPR-Cas editing systems in which a transposase is now RNA-guided, meaning that you can use the fundamental targeting mechanism of CRISPR-Cas to direct integration of DNA through the chemical activity of a transposase enzyme. And I'll show you shortly um, you know, what that enables, but uh, this was uh, the work primarily led by Brady Kress in the lab. And so these CRISPR-Cas uh, transposases take the, the transposase and couple it to the RNA-guided CRISPR-associated protein, as shown here, that allow what effectively is all-in-one targeted editing. And a big advantage of this type of strategy in microbes is that you don't aren't going you aren't going through a double-stranded DNA break uh, intermediate, which for many microbes is just a non-starter that just you know kills the cells and, and there's no there's no going forward from it. Whereas in this strategy, the transposase is not making a double-stranded break; it's actually doing a very coordinated reaction that results in DNA integration. Except that here, rather than being a non-specific uh, integration event, it's coupled to the RNA guided binding of the CRISPR-Cas protein. And importantly here, what um, was shown in the, this uh, original research is that these Cas proteins in the context of transposases have lost their ability to cut DNA themselves. So they no longer generate a double-stranded break. In fact, here they're just operating as an, RN, uh, as a, an RNA guided DNA binding protein that provides the specificity for the, uh, the adjacent transposase to do its chemistry. And, um, and we found, so we tested both of the published systems, and we actually found that the system that was published by the Sternberg lab, which is uh, cartooned here, what had some important advantages. Um, one disadvantage, however, is that it's a, a system that requires multiple protein components that are RNA-guided. And so in this original uh, publication from the Sternberg lab, they had used three different plasmids for delivery into bacteria of these uh, delivery, these, delivering these different components. And so it, the first thing that Brady Crest did was to develop a way to, to uh, encode all of these components in a single plasmid that he called a uh, VC dart. And so this includes not only the, 
uh, the guide RNA and uh, the, the transposon cargo where this uh, can be manipulated to be different uh, desired sequences, but also this set of CAS genes that are that encode proteins required for the assembly of a functional RNA-guided uh, transposase complex. So with that in hand, um, he first tested, you know, just how specific is the system? And we were very excited to see that this uh, VC DART uh, system is incredibly selective. It's really addicted to the RNA guide, and we really uh, only detect integration events at sequences in the genome that are um, that are uh, uh, being detected and and uh, interacted by the the RNA guide itself. And so this is one example of this kind of uh, sequencing reaction showing the specificity of the integration event. And, um, and that's in contrast to a, an alternative CRISPR transposase where although simpler in the sense that it had, it didn't have as many protein components to it, it turned out to be much, much less uh, selective and, and much less dependent on the RNA guide. And so that was a strong motivation for going with the system that's shown here. And then using this, uh, what, the, what Brady and, and Bannon and Spencer proceeded to do was to use this CAS guided, this uh, uh, CRISPR CAS guided transposase to edit a microbial community. And so they originally did this in the, the synthetic community that I described previously, where uh, one could introduce different markers, such as an antibiotic marker was convenient that could provide for selective pressure that would allow easy identification of microbes that had acquired the inserted sequence. And the hope was to see the kind of thing that's cartooned here, where by changing the guide RNA that was the component, uh, the guiding component of the system, you could direct these integration events to different organisms in the population without affecting the others. And um, we were very pleased to see that this, this worked in incredibly well. And so this is just showing a plot of, in each case, three independent experiments done with this um, nine member community and um, maybe it's 10, I guess it's, yeah. And um, uh, that where the community members are shown over here and um, we start with three different uh, different uh, um, uh, cultures of the, these uh, community samples and do the breakdown according to the composition. You can see it's quite similar in each case. One of the real advantages of working with these synthetic communities is that kind of replicability. And then after treating them with these, um, these CRISPR CAS guided transposases that are targeting different organisms within the community, you can see that after selection, we get very nice um, uh, outgrowth of the organism that has received the uh, selectable marker and not of anybody else. And so it really shows the, the, select, the selective uh, targeting that's achieved through this kind of a strategy. And then finally, we were very interested to ask whether we could do this kind of targeting in a more natural uh, microbial population. And so we were able to get uh, samples of infant gut microbiomes from a uh, lab at Stanford. And uh, through a lot of work, uh, figured out how to grow these in a way that was quite reproducible in terms of the uh, component organism population in, in these samples. And then it turned out that uh, there were E. coli species that were very closely related in these organisms, except that they had different uh, sets of virulence genes. And so Brady Kress was able to use this difference in these genomes to design guide RNAs that we hoped would allow highly selective targeting of one E. coli strain over the other. And um, in experiments conducted very similar to what I showed you on the previous slide with the nine member synthetic community, we found uh, this to be the case. And so we have the pre-edit community shown over here, again, three different uh, uh, outgrowths of that. And, um, and then following selection, following transposase uh, treatment and selection, we found that with both of these targets, we got um, quite efficient outgrowth of the organism that had received the target, uh, the, the um, integrated gene and not the others. 
And so we're hopeful that this kind of strategy in the future will allow manipulation of individual organisms in natural microbiomes. And of course, there's a lot of work still to be done. We obviously need to increase the accessibility of different kinds of organisms for this sort of technology. And we need to deeply understand, we need to have the metagenomic sequences, of course, so we know what to edit. We're also trying to figure out how do we uh, how do we measure outgrowth? It would be nice if we didn't have to always depend on some kind of selection for this. Um, and that's something that um, Ben and Brady and Spencer will be working hard on in their own labs at the IGI. Um, but fundamentally, we'd like to have an editing pipeline to allow strain-specific editing, enrichment, and, and of course, genome assembly. So we're at a point where uh, we've got a what looks like a, um, uh, a pathway towards a generalizable tool set for community editing that would include using some kind of sequencing-based strategy to figure out who's editable in the community, what's the, what, what is the genetic accessibility of different organisms, and importantly, how to deliver DNA that will be most uh, effective at introducing that DNA into organisms of interest within a community. And then using um, species and locus-specific editing through the application of CRISPR transposases and if you're following the, the CRISPR field, you probably know that this is a very rapidly advancing area of the field where there are more CRISPR transposases being found all the time. And those that are, are identified are being uh, tested increasingly for um, experimental utility. We just uh, were at a Cold Spring Harbor meeting where the Sternberg lab showed evidence that one of these CRISPR transposases can be used to insert DNA sequences into plasmids in eukaryotic cells, and perhaps in the future this will become possible to do more um, editing in eukaryotic cells with these systems. But of course, for the work we're talking about here, they're already very good at manipulating uh, microbial genomes. So that's exciting. And then thirdly, that um, there's uh, you know, a demonstrated editing pipeline in natural communities, like the example of the infant gut microbiome that I showed. And so we're excited about the potential there. And of course, working with the Banfield group, we're, we're, uh, we're very excited about the opportunities in environmental microbial communities, such as those found in water and soil. And so these CRISPR tr programmable transposons, can we know they can edit complex microbiomes. Right now, they have very high specificity, but low efficiency. And so that's one of the future goals is to be able to increase the efficiency and that could allow expansion of species accessibility while also enhancing uh, uh, the transformability of different organisms as we continue to uncover potentially new ways of doing transformation, perhaps through identifying the kinds of natural mechanisms that are at work in these microbial systems. And I, I very much imagine that, you know, as the technology continues to advance, it will help uncover some of that fundamental microbial biology that will in turn feed back into making the technology better. So these are, you know, it's sort of a very natural synergy between technology development and fundamental biology um, uh, questions that can be addressed that is going to carry the field uh, forward. And so I'm going to I'm going to uh, stop by acknowledging an incredible group of people that I've had the pleasure of working with. This is a picture taken at a recent uh, Doudna Lab where, retreat uh, where we, we 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 invited every every undergraduate and summer student and um, uh, technician and joint student et cetera to to come with us. And so it was really really fun, a great group of people. I want to give a particular shout out to the folks whose work I highlighted today. Josh Kofsky and Kasha Sokzek, a current postdoc in the lab, teamed up to work on the biophysical and structural analysis of CRISPR-Cas9 that I talked about briefly today. And then, of course, Brady, Ben, and Spencer, who are now uh, the uh, foundational investigators in BiomeForge, who will be pushing forward on the use of CRISPR editing technology in microbial 
communities and microbiomes. And then they've been, of course, uh, benefited from a lot of other members of our lab and affiliated labs, including the Banfield Group, Adam Deutschbauer, Rudolf Barengo at North Carolina State University, and Trent Northern, who have all been um, wonderful to work with. And we've had funding for this particular work, especially the microbial uh, editing work from not only the NIH, but also MCAFEs, the Department of, uh, of uh, Energy and uh, J. Bay and the Sheryl and K. Kersey Foundation, who gave a generous gift recently to allow the microbiome, uh, micro, uh, the Biome Forge team to to get started. So I'll thank you. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And, and if we have time for questions, I'm of course happy to to address them. So we're a little bit over time, but I would say we'll make time for one quick question. Do we have a question in the audience? If not, we'll, yes. Thank you very much for the talk. Yeah, my main question is like, how do you propose to overcome the need for antibiotic selection? Like, I do not understand how, you, how this can be achieved possibly. Because yeah. that's really the crucial thing for microbiome editing, right? To overcome that step. Yeah, for sure. I think I think an approach that the team is making right now is to ask, can we introduce genes that are beneficial that allow metabolism of particular, um, you know, of particular carbon sources um, that give the, you know, an organism an environmental advantage in some way, um, you know, that wouldn't be antibiotic based. So that's that's one one idea. Um, and I think, you know, I think going forward, the, 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 we're hoping that we're going to learn enough about the biology of these communities that you could manipulate bugs in a way that give them some kind of environmental advantage in their setting that would be independent of, my, of antibiotic selection. But that, you're right, that is, that is a very important uh, thing that, uh, problem that needs to be addressed going forward.